who for over 17 years has investigated and exposed political conspiracies worldwide. World Watchers International originates at KLRB, Carmel, California. Here's May. Okay, should we start over? <laughs> we'll start over here. This is May Brussel in Carmel, California. It's broadcast number 534. It's February the 28th, 1982. Casper Weinberger, Secretary of Defense, has asked the administration for $258 billion for the defense budget for 1983. That does not include the spying, the Defense Intelligence Agency, the CIA, the Navy Intelligence, National Security Council, and the spy systems. He's asked for a budget of $258 billion. He's asked for $1.6 trillion in the next five years to arm against the Soviet Union. A member of Congress, Representative James Jones of Oklahoma, asked, how big is $1 trillion if you measure it? And he gave one example. If someone was to spend $1 million a day, starting the day that Christ was born, 1982 years ago, a million dollars a day through the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, the Age of Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, and the modern era, every day spending one million dollars every 24 hours, he would only spend half of what Caspar Weinberger wants for weapons in the next five years. $1.6 trillion, he says, will rearm the United States. And, of course, that is for an aggressive war against the Soviet Union. Our Hoppy, who's a columnist in San Francisco, I think just for the San Francisco Chronicle, I don't believe it's syndicated, had a program, had an article, not a radio program, an article several weeks ago in the Chronicle called Buy a Gorilla. And he breaks down the cost of the money that we're sending into El Salvador and the 500 million, three to 500 million that the president has asked to send down there to the troops in El Salvador with an estimate of five to 6,000 guerrilla soldiers, and the Salvadoran police have an army of about 20,000. And he suggested that we send them binary bombs. That is one half of the bomb is made of $100,000, and the other half has a Sears Roebuck catalog or a booklet of things that they can buy with the 100000 And he said if the bomb hits them, it squashes them, and if it misses them, he can be instantly converted to capitalism and he goes on to say that the Vietnam War cost us about $344,000 for every dead guerrilla fighter. And what good did it do us, much less killing these people? And he suggested, uh, tongue-in-cheek, but very seriously, of course, why not just send the money and a catalog of things to buy and forget all of the killing? And, of course, that makes sense, except that this economy is dependent upon the kind of mentality of making war. And I'll get back to that in one minute. I did want to mention that George Corcola, George Gregory Corcola, was arrested in Madrid this week. Many of you have heard me speak about him on uh, these programs for the past two years. He was on 60 Minutes, and then disappeared with Frank Turpel. They were arrested in New York City in December of 79 with weapons and machine guns and silencers and ammunition and fled the country. Kirkola has been apprehended in Madrid. His name has been out of the news much uh, less. It's not in there as much as Frank Turpel or Edwin Wilson. He is the fellow that from New Jersey who worked with Mitchell Werbel procuring silencers for assassination teams, making weapons that blow up various people. He has a whole academy of weapons for killing people, works with Samuel Cummings in London. He also does security for the FBI, the Secret Service for the United States Intelligence and for Scotland Yard and clients such as Standard Oil, Chevron and so forth. He is a very powerful man. He's armed the Omega 7 in New York City with links to the Alpha 66 and headed up the uh, terrorism teams in the United States just as the CIA funded the Red Brigades and terrorism around Europe. He's a very important person. I imagine that the tip-off on the arrest of Corcola has to come from Edwin Wilson, his superior, who's floating around for immunity in Europe, offering uh, to the American uh, Justice Department, if you call it justice, 
immunity if he would turn in certain people that worked for him. He specifically had said several people in Chile that were in on the killing of Orlando Letelier. He is, Edwin Wilson is the fellow who has that large estate next door to Senator John Warner and is a very powerful man in Corcola and Turbo worked with him and for him. I imagine that the tip-off probably came from Wilson in order to change Wilson's stature with the American government. He wants to come home. This week, I noticed that there were several deaths from the kinds of weapons these men make. One's from the Houston Post, February 21st. Luggage bomb kills three in Managua, uh, Nicaragua. Bomb planted inside a piece of luggage exploded Saturday night at the International Airport, killing three people. And also, there was a, an article about a briefcase bomb of a person in Fairlawn, New Jersey. That was also last week. A dynamite-filled briefcase exploded and killed a pregnant woman. Authorities said she may not have been the intended victim. The briefcase was in her car. She opened it, it exploded, and she died instantly. Now, one of the fellows that worked for them, for Wilson and Turple and Corcola, pleaded guilty last week, February the 13th. Douglas M. Schlachter, he pleaded guilty to sending weapons and training the school in Libya that Gaddafi has for violence. Schlachter worked for Wilson and Turple. He helped set up the explosive school in Libya. He helped them disguise bombs in ashtrays and lamps, alarm clocks, in boxes of tea. And these are the kind of uh, briefcases and suitcase luggage things that explode. He has a school down in Libya that he trained. Schlachter, S-C-H-L-A-C-H-T-E-R, formerly managed Edwin Wilson's 2,400-acre estate in Fakur County in Virginia. As I said, that's next door to Senator John Warner. And he's pleaded guilty. He was working with the operation, he says, with the CIA, and he assumed that it was for the CIA that he confirmed with high-ranking CIA officials while he was doing this in the Washington area of 1976 and 1977. Now, that's when George Bush was director of the CIA that Mr. Schlachter was conferring with the CIA and arming Gaddafi and Idi Amin, which I mentioned before, that he was contracted in 1976 to go over with Gaddafi to sell Gaddafi to sell the expertise in intelligence and military equipment. Schlachter said in court papers that he asked the judge to bring in persons from the CIA that he worked with, and one that he mentioned was Thomas Kleins, that he worked with regularly. Kleins is the fellow that set up the offices of Tursam in Switzerland that were funding money that was supposed to go to Anwar Sadat, to Sadat's enemies, who later were responsible for killing him when the CIA knew that Sadat would be killed. Thomas Kleins, G. Kleins, was one of the people he worked with. And the judge turned down the request for uh, former CIA director Stanfield Turner, who took over from George Bush to talk about this matter. Turner was an admiral, graduated from Annapolis with Jimmy Carter, and Turner and Kleins do not have to appear in court. The papers are sealed, and Mr. Schlachter said that if they were present and available, the documents, he would show the circumstances by which he armed Gaddafi, that he was meeting with the high-level CIA. And as I say, George Bush in 1966-67 was the director of the CIA and uh, was heading assassination teams at the time, including the Letelier murder in Washington, D.C., and the cover-up afterwards. I want to mention just briefly a few articles on the airplane flights that we covered for the past four or five weeks on this program. There were some inter interesting articles about various airplane problems in the past week. One, Air Cal suspends two pilots during a probe. An airplane from Ontario, California, uh, went down, and the instrument landing material was out of order when the accident occurred. This is the San Jose Mercury Sunday, February 21st. The pilots don't remember everything they said uh, or precisely. It was vague, and they didn't have information that they were flying low even though the plane before them did uh, was told that they were flying low and were alerted. Unknown to the pilots, the hydraulic lines that operated the plane's brakes and reverse thrusters had been broken. The aircraft was unable to stop on the second runway and skidded off the end into an embankment. Does that sound familiar with the Boston problem? They said they still don't know why the radar failed to warn the controllers that the plane was too low. Moments before that accident, the radar warned a United Airlines flight four miles ahead, that they were too low, but no alarm sounded for Air 
Cal. Another article on this says Air Cal landing aid um, was broken. The altimeter wasn't, but the National Transportation Safety Board said the instrument landing system at the airport could have warned the pilots of their low altitude, except that the instrument that they had on the plane had been broken for two weeks. And another article says a navigational aid known as the glide scope of the instrument landing was out of service on the approach at the time of the accident. The airport skidded. It didn't go in the water in this case, but went into the mud at the end of the flight. It rolled off. Another uh, continuation of that Japanese airline, the Washington Post had an article last week, Japan widens the probe amid reports on their pilot. The Washington Post story says he may have been mentally unstable. They're still looking into the cause of the crash, that he had stress related problems. He was grounded in 1980 until August of that year, from November till August of the next year, under continued observation. Uh, he was out of sorts the day of the flight. He was shown by newspaper pictures inexplicably dressed in what appears to be civilian clothes. He was one of the first of the survivors rescued. The pilots complained uh, that he had told them, his co-pilots, that his home had been bugged since August 1980. All of his conversations had been monitored, and there was a hole in the wall that he had punched in the ceiling looking for bugging devices. The Japanese investigators have only made public a few things about this airplane. He began yelling loudly as the plane made its final approach, and he said to one of the co-pilots, look what you've done, and they yelled back at him unemotionally, oh, I've done it, as one of the pilots went flying. His seatbelt wasn't attached. The tape aboard the voice recorder and the aircraft has a series of abnormally loud noises in the cockpit shortly before the crash, and they're undergoing a voice pattern uh, question they don't know what it's caused by. They found it incredible that the pilot was dressed in civilian clothes, was the first to leave the airplane. They have a ruling in Japan, a law that he stays there and helps rescue passengers, and Japan has prided itself on that, but he was one of the first off. Another article on this airplane crash in Japan, uh, besides the mental problems and the recorded voice problems, uh, a co-pilot said, Captain, please quit it two seconds before the plane crashed. And uh, the night before, he had taken that plane out in an acrobatic maneuver. The same pilot that had the trouble, who said he was being bugged, who had mental problems, who got off the plane, who was in civilian clothes, uh, took the plane out the night before the crash. He piloted and he had the same crew, and he was about 500 miles from the shore, and he made three abrupt turns and went into circles and plunged 1,100 feet. And there was no turbulence that night, and he was doing some very crazy things and acting irresponsible. Another article uh, says that he didn't rem remember anything that he was doing, and as I mentioned last week or the week before, the first report said he was killed, and then they went on to say that he was alive and in a hospital. He walked out of there, but they have him in a mental hospital. The plane was in a nosedive by pushing forward on the control stick. The plane's flight recorder showed the nose of the aircraft moved upward the last seconds before the crash. This is similar to the Arab Florida crash that went into the Potomac and was just one week later. And this fellow was told he couldn't fly last year without proper qualifications. He was grounded, and at the time of the flight, he was not supposed to be flying. He lacked the qualifications for getting back, and the psychiatrist said he was a hypochondriac, but that doesn't explain the change of clothes, having the plane out the night before. Now, as far as the Boston crash that happened three days or five days after the Air Florida, the Los Angeles Times has a story, earlier jet warned of ice, the tapes reveal, and yet the World Airways was not told about them. Now, what I'm trying to bring out about these airplanes is that something ridiculous or dangerous, both, is going on with the airlines right now. The major airlines are all losing a lot of money. There are transactions to take over the smaller airlines, and there are a lot of unusual problems all bunched together that occurred at one time. This article from the L.A. Times says seven minutes before World Airways slid on an icy runway in Boston, another jumbo jet pilot was warned that of the runway that it was poor, but World Airways was not warned. Uh, airport officials could not explain why the controllers did not relay the information to the world flight, maintaining that they could have told them and they didn't, 
and 35 minutes before they told the other airline, a Delta, the conditions there were serious. They knew the runway was trouble, but the recordings show that they did not inform them, but they informed other airplanes. Then another article, Boston Jets controller said to have aired in past. This air flight controller had problems December the 18th last year. He failed to monitor the progress of an airplane that was too close to flight. And there were problems with other airplanes, and they covered this up uh, for some reason or other. The same person that didn't tell them that they were having trouble with the ice when they came in um, had other problems that aired, and they concealed those up till now. Now, in Miami, there was a second attempt to hijack an Air Florida, and another question came out. This is a Los Angeles Times again. A would-be hijacker fired two airport gate agents and police officers. He acted nervous and purchased a one-way ticket and got tried to get on the airplane, the Air Florida, and he said that he was homesick for Cuba. He hadn't been there for several months. But the question they asked was, how did the man with a 25 caliber automatic handgun get through the concourse security checkpoints in Miami International. It's one thing to be homesick for Cuba, it's another to get through the security point, heavily armed, and try to get on Air Florida. And there was an extortion try against United Airlines. This is February 27th. Uh, this came out in again in the, uh, this Associated Press and San Francisco Chronicle. The FBI is investigating a $7 million extortion attempt against United Airlines. A pipe bomb explosion on Thursday in the airport lot is linked to the plot, and they're going into the investigation of uh, an explosion, a pickup truck, and some questionable persons trying to uh, extort money, $7 million, from United Airlines down in San Diego. Uh, along those lines, I don't know how it affects these uh, incidences here with the pilots or the towers acting irregularly. There was an article, again in the L.A. Times, Japanese uh, were gassed and robbed on a Soviet train. Four high-ranking Japanese nuclear experts were sitting on a plane where a chemical was used, and they were put to sleep, and they were robbed of passports and information. The chemical has not been identified. They're senior executives of the Hitachi Corporation involved in the advanced application of atomic uh, energy. They were visiting the Soviet Union and some kind of a chemical or gas was used on the four Japanese scientists that were there. They uh, were put to sleep uh, with a sleep-inducing gas and then they woke up and when they woke up their papers were gone with the passports and so forth. I wonder if uh, the, what kind of mind control or chemicals can be used on these planes or trains and it really is dangerous as long as it goes uh, it just hinted in the news that there's major problems, but then, of course, they become unsolved and they fade away, and we probably won't hear any more about these airlines for a long time. Now, I read an article about El Salvador last night that really upset me. There's very few articles that I read, I'm pretty strong, that get me as upset as this one, and I want to share it with you. I usually outline articles before I come in, but I want to read most of it to you because I think it's very, very important about our policy and a couple of more items about El Salvador that pertain to it. As far as Casper Weinberger wanting all this money, this one and a half trillion for five years, this team is totally crazy. Mr. Brzezinski before them, Henry Kissinger, Alexander Haig, and Casper Weinberger. A sign of, of the insanity was a comment that Alexander Haig made this last week. Foreign policy is not based on national mood. Maybe you saw that or maybe you didn't. It was the Associated Press last uh, February 17th. Domestic opposition doesn't necessarily determine what the Reagan administration is going to do with regards to El Salvador. This is a Haig quotation. If we were to determine our foreign policy based on the lowest common denominator of the national mood, I think we would be on fallacious grounds, implying that the anti-war people, the people that don't want to wipe out the populations in El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, and so forth, the peace people, are the lowest common denominator. And that is the way they speak about us. Haig said he was not uncomfortable with the notion that American people would not support sending forces to El Salvador. I think the majority of Americans would be appalled at the prospect of American involvement of military anywhere in the world, but our foreign policy is not based on that. 
and he made it very clear. Uh, that is the way Haig talks. Now, this week, and I mentioned last week, the Opus Dei, the meeting uh, in the Vatican of the Pope, the, the paper this morning, the San Francisco Chronicle Examiner, the wire service says, the Pope warns liberal Jesuits, stay out of politics. Now, Haig is a Catholic. He's a good Catholic. He calls himself the vicar. His brother's a Jesuit priest of the more strict and conservative order, or a he's active. Uh, yeah, he is a priest in Washington, vicar of the uh, White House is what uh, Haig referred to himself at the time that Reagan was shot last year. Pope John Paul II told the influential Jesuit religious order under fire for its liberalism, keep out of politics and honor Roman Catholic tradition. This is a quote of the Pope. There is no longer any place for deviations that have been harmful to the vitality of communities and of the church. Another quote, the necessary concern for justice must be exercised in conformity with your vocation as a priest and brother. This is the Pope talking now to the Jesuits in Rome. They're meeting this last week. He says, some of the liberationists in Latin America aren't going to like it, a Rome-based Jesuit said. As he said, the left should stay out of politics. The left, according to the Associated Press, was the main target. The pontiff told the Jesuit leaders that the rules of the Roman Catholics must be followed as the church defines them and not according to personal criteria and psychosociological theories. Now, this is the pope who had a good whiff and smell of blood in Auschwitz, who went on to Montini, secretary of the Vatican after the war, who then became a Catholic priest and has worked with these organizations all of his life and with those people stirring up problems in Europe today. He is saying, and I've said before, that he is there to tell you, stay away. There's going to be a bloodbath in Central America. And now to the article that upset me. Um, this was the New York Times, February the 19th. Salvador candidate is called a killer, and he's running well in the election campaign. This has to do with Mr. Roberto de Abisson, A-B-U-I-S-S-O-N. He's the member of the right-wing party, the far right-wing Nazi group who's being supported by Senator Jesse Helms for the new president of El Salvador. He says that the concern of the American officials over these elections has nothing to do with the violence that is going to take place. Roberto is a 38-year-old cashiered army officer long associated with coup attempts and paramilitary campaigns. He promises that if he is elected president of El Salvador against Duarte, that he will exterminate the guerrillas within three months of the convening of the Constitution in March. Now, Hitler was in power in March 1933. He says, well, if I'm in, napalm is indispensable. I will kill the native population in El Salvador. The armed forces will be freed of human rights restrictions. And this is the man that our Senator Jesse Helms and members of our Congress of the moral majority are pushing for the president of El Salvador in the elections. He said napalm is indispensable. Human rights will go out the door and we will be encouraged then to invade Nicaragua. We don't believe the army needs controlling. This is the Washington Post, New York Times, rather, February 19th. Civilians will be killed. War has always been that way. When the Germans bombed London, they didn't tell the civilians to get out of the way first, did they? Now, he isn't saying when the British bombed Germany, they didn't tell them because, as I mentioned, for the last two or three weeks on this program, Fritz Kramer, the Nazi, the iron mentor of Alexander Haig and Henry Kissinger and in our State Department making the policy for the people training down in Florida and Georgia and Fort Bragg now to kill the population down there. He is saying, I will use napalm. I will kill these people. I will kill civilians. This is part of my attack, he says, if I am president. Now, they've described the Robert E. White, the former ambassador to El Salvador, who was brought home, testified that Mr. Del Busion is a pathological killer. The State Department has compelling, if not 100% conclusive evidence. He ordered the assassination of Archbishop Oscar Romero in March of 1980. In fact, when they came to his office, 
uh, to get the papers and the evidence about that, he started to eat the papers to conceal his link. Now, the Pope isn't complaining about this man uh, killing a Catholic priest, an archbishop, down there right in the church. He went into the church and gunned him down at the time of the service. He didn't physically, but his men and his troops did. He lectures about subversive infiltration of the Salvadoran institutions. He has an election going, and he represents a party that is gaining in power now and money that is going down there is also going to him. He says the communists are criminales with the habits of animals, and they better tremble when he gets in. He has high-heeled boots. Uh, he's five foot six inches high and wears these tall boots. Now, his army, his National Republic Alliance, is linked to Miami, Florida, to the Central Intelligence Agency, and this man is going around running for the president of El Salvador. So it's a question of sending money to Mr. Duarte to stop the guerrilla movement that goes in his hands, and he may easily win the election, just as Hitler did. He's opposed to Mr. Duarte, and he, he compares him to a patsy. He says he's green. He holds a watermelon and says a green, it's green like his opponent, Duarte, but it's red inside, and he travels around with watermelons. But he has said that the name of his operation will be uh, complete napalm and murder of the native population, and he will try Duarte and the Christian Democratic Party for treason for trying to pacify and have land reforms of the slimmest kind. He tried several times to take over by a military hunt in October 79 and in May of 1980. He was arrested for video cassettes of himself uh, with right-wing counter coup groups, and he concealed, as I say, documents of his involvement of um, the shooting of the archbishop in Temple. He was always thought to have a following among large landowners, some businessmen in the capital, and they're monitoring the elections to see if he gets in. Uh, he's warned now, fair warning, and this is the New York Times, just as Hitler warned and Mussolini warned, that he will kill and napalm and eliminate all of the native population if he's elected. Now, that was in the New York Times, February 19th. It turned out that somebody shot at this candidate, Major Roberto de Busson, yesterday. Uh, there are several reports, one that a bullet went in his chest and came out his back. The other was that it was a nick on the shoulder. He has a very heavy armored car. He's protected. He has automatic weapons. He isn't dead. They tried to kill him yesterday, uh, but they missed. Another political leader, Rafael Rodriguez of the National Conciliation Party, was shot to death outside his home January 27th. And there have been a lot of killings. Of course, we know there's about 10,000 that have died in the past year down there. This man has army trained in the United States and a lot of support. Now, if you saw an article today, United States support for Duarte should stop. This is Senator Jesse Helms from North Carolina, where Fort Bragg is training the troops for this Roberto de Busian. He says we should stop sending money down to Duarte, that he's a leftist. If we continue to support Duarte, Helms says it's a mistake. Let's face it, he's far to the left of George McGovern. And the members of our Senate are trying to say that uh, this other person who will use the napalm and the gunning of the native population is the one that should be in. He's being supported by the far right Nazi faction in our Congress and in North Carolina and in Florida by the troops. There are many honest and attractive politicians in El Salvador. This article came out to, uh, today. And men who are for the free enterprise system, who are absolutely faithful to the United States, to human dignity, who are for traditional values. Now, the tradition and the family, it has an official title, is a paramilitary Nazi group that was set up in South America and Brazil, the death squads that are used in these countries. It's the tradition of the family, the church, and so forth. And the tone of this uh, decent group, Richard, Mr. Uh, Jesse Helms, is referring to uh, Duarte as being a left-wing socialist, and he's speaking for negotiated settlements with the Marxists that Mr. Duarte would make, and he says, what kind of a nonsense is this? Now, Alexander Haig and Jesse Helms and that gang want to put in Roberto de Busian, and if you want to know what he would do in El Salvador, with the elections coming up in March, then read the New York Times, February the 19th, 1982. The New York Times has an 
picture this last week of the Salvadorian troops arriving at Fort Benning, Georgia. There's an officer's training group of 156 becoming officers at Columbus, Georgia. There's another 1,000 at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Uh, we're training these people and putting money into the military for this bloodbath. Richard, uh, I keep wanting to call him Richard Helms because of the CIA, and there isn't much difference of their background and where they came from. Jesse Helms from North Carolina and the Fort Bragg, North Carolina, training 1,000 people to go back and make war, according to the New York Times, against those four to 6,000 leftist guerrillas with all the ammunition that America has to offer. Breakdown of some people involved with Air Florida and the Western Airlines, the MGM can of worms. We're going to go that in one minute. I do want to mention that the articles this week from the newspaper link uh, Lech Walesa with the squads in Poland that want World War III. He wanted to put up gallows there. Ten days before the martial law was called, they had plans for murders and that the solidarity is not a labor union. Then the articles in the New York Times, Washington Post, and Wire Services that Mr. Walesa has been using a book and I have that book. It's called The Third World War, August 1985. And there are many references in that book to Poland. It's written by NATO commanders, General Sir John Hackett, published by Macmillan in London and Bar Berkeley Press. It is the script for instigating Russia to get into a war, forcing them to respond in Poland so we get World War III. And there have been allegations in the newspapers this past week of Lech Walesa and the construction of gallows and the plan for a bloodbath in Poland. That is what he's up to. I'll do more on Poland in a few weeks, but I just want to mention that this was in the news this week, and that book has been the script for Wallace's instigations in Poland. They have nothing to do with labor unions. They have to do with World War III. We'll take a one-minute break now and get on to uh, this other subject. I want to continue on. This concludes the first half of World Watchers International with May Brussel. We will return. Okay, this is May Brussel. If we're having trouble with the tape cassette or with the control rooms, Matthew isn't here tonight, and we're having a... If the tape ran over on the first half or it begins on the second half, we're going to have trouble here with this. Uh, there's somebody new in the control room or helping out. So bear with us. The radio, the live radio, it won't make any difference, but if you get the cassettes, you may find one end cut off or the other not starting right. We'll have to get this <laughs> coordinated. I'm looking at the clock and doing the best I can, but there's some problems here. Okay, I want to talk some more about Western Airlines and Air Florida and the crazy um, arrangement of the structure of these various airlines and the mechanics. Something is going on in these airlines. I don't know what it is, but uh, by the articles I shared with you the first half, there's some very weird things taking place. And just two days before Air Florida crashed, they'd never had a crash. They'd been operating 10 years, and two days before they crashed, I mentioned that uh, Neil Berg, who came into Western Airlines in October of 1981, had a appointed into Western Airlines a several new directors on the board of Western Airlines. And Western was being bid for Air Florida, wanted to take control of Western Airlines, and the people who had it, Kirk Kerkorian and the people who were holding Western, were losing a lot of money, but they didn't want to let Western out of their hands. And Neil Burke from Alaska, who travels around and picks up a huge amount of money, $50 million, to put into Wien, Alaska, and then uh, parlay that into Western. Neil Berg uh, went to Western Airlines in um, October of 1980 and said, I want to manage Western Airlines and take care of it. And by ju in June, in 81 rather, um, Air Florida wanted control. And Neil Berg came in and, and said, uh, I'll work for no salary and I'll take care of it. And Neil Berg, acting with no salary, appointed on the board of Western Airlines. He increased the board to 15 members. There were 12 before. And I mentioned several weeks ago and last week that one of the people he put on the board was Fred Benninger. Now, Fred Benninger is 65 years old. He manages the MGM 
Grand Hotel in Las Vegas. And I'm going to run down with you as quickly as I can a background on Fred Benninger and Kirk Kikorian, who was the head of Western Airlines, who built it up. Because in this can of worms of uh, people competing for particular airlines or stepping in and controlling them with unknown funds of money coming from overseas, from German banks and British banks and goodness knows where overseas money is 50 million here, 50 million there. It's interesting to know who you're dealing with and where they came from. And once in a while, I do biographies of certain people. And I thought I would do the Kirk Kikorian story tonight for several reasons. And one of the reasons is that it goes back to the Permandex story, the, the assassination cabal that was put together on who killed John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, the assassination teams, and the role that these interlocking people uh, have with each other. And uh, uh, they're the heads of huge corporations, motion picture studios, airlines, hotels, entertainment industry, their attorneys, uh, such as for Kirk Kikorian uh, and his, re- his Caesars World is William Casey, the director of the CIA, uh, they are closely aligned and linked to the intelligence community with unknown funds. And what we think of as ordinary businesses uh, have these mysterious fundings behind them and international and national connections. And the ones that I refer usually go back to people who are directly or indirectly linked to those assassination teams that I've studied for 17 years. Now, Kirk Kikorian in 1942 was a flyer. He was an instructor in the United States. And when war broke out, he joined the British RAF, which is interesting. If he lived in the United States, he came from a family up in Kern County. That's Earl Warren country. His father had a farm, and the farm gushed oil. And instead of fighting for the United States Army, we were at war. He went and joined the RAF until June 44. Then he began working for a transport command, and that took him to India and Africa. And he bought the Los Angeles Air Service in 1947. That's when World War II was over, the year that the CIA was formed. And he operated a charter service all over the West and from Las Vegas down to Del Mar and so forth. The Los Angeles Air Service in 1956 began contracts for military people from Charleston, South Carolina to Tripoli, Libya. And interesting, it was Neil Burke who sent the C-130 over uh, by way of Miami to uh, Libya, to Gaddafi at a time that they weren't supposed to be sending him planes, and Edwin Wilson of the CIA was sending these pilots to run these planes. Uh, Kerkorian was flying from Charleston, South Carolina, to Tripoli in Libya in 1956. In 1967, the Los Angeles Air Service became the TIA, the Trans International Air Service, in 1960. It changed names, and Kerkorian was dealing with Douglas Aircraft in 1962 and uh, began what he called the Jet Trader. He amassed as much as he could in his new airline, his trans-international airline, according to a book on Kerkorian, and the Bank of America agreed to finance most of the rest. And you see, Kerkorian's lucky. He always comes up with a lot of money, and Mr. Giannini and Bank of America uh, helped him with the rest. He began his military routes starting in June 22, 1962. That's after Kennedy was in and just uh, not long, a year and a half before Kennedy was killed. And he was flying from Travis Air Force Base to Guam. And he had contracts of $1.6 million in commercial and $4 million in military contracts. Um, the six, years from 62 to 66 in this biography are kind of missing. But in the interim, in 1966, Howard Hughes the mysterious billionaire uh, working with the intelligence community and the military and the Lockheed organizations and used aircraft, uh, moved into Las Vegas to the Desert Inn Hotel on a stretcher. A mysterious person in the dark of night who nobody really saw in Vegas moves in and brings $200 million into Nevada, where Kirk Kukorin also is going to be very active. In 1968, and uh, Howard Hughes is there with Robert Mayhew and his assassination teams from 1966 to 1970 when he mysteriously flies out. So two years after Hughes is there, in 1968, uh, Kerkorian comes in and purchases the Flamingo Hotel. It's owned by him. He's considered one of the richest men in the United States, and he's competing. He and Hughes are in this town, and they are establishing the Vegas bases or the Hughes organization. There is no Hughes that's visible. 
Now, he takes over the Flamingo Hotel in 1968. Kerkorian does that belong to Bugsy Siegel, a controversial person who was gunned down in 1947 the home of Virginia Hill. Siegel was murdered about two blocks from my parents' house and two blocks from where Howard Hughes had his plane crash on Linden Drive. It's right off of Walden. And he took over this uh, hotel linked with organized crime with Meyer Lansky and uh, Bugsy Siegel. Las Vegas had been building up the various hotels from 1950. Uh, They began to uh, grow. It was a watering stop for railroads in 1905, and the syndicate came in. In 1954, Ronald Reagan was playing at the Frontier Hotel in Vegas, interestingly enough, on his stint before he goes to General Electric, and they've designed him to be uh, tarted around for the future president of the United States. In 1950, Albert Albert Parvin uh, was supplying hotels and restaurants with equipment, and he was linked to organized crime, and he got control of the Flamingo Hotel, and by 1960, he sold it to Sam Cohn, Meyer Lansky's partner, and organized crime, the point I'm trying to make, was very heavy in there. One, They turned their profits into a uh, foundation called International Understanding, and the president of the foundation was Supreme Court Justice William Douglas. He got $12,000 a year from the foundation since 1962. Meyer Lansky got a fraction of selling the Flamingo Hotel and Kerkorian was uh, established in Vegas in that area. The Flamingo, for one while, belonged to Morris Landsberg, Daniel Lifter, and various members of the the Meyer Lansky gang. And later, Kerkorian is to be linked heavily and in scandals with the organized crime and the mafia. Uh, in this area, the, the by 1966, Kerkorian has the Caesar's Palace. That's the, uh, across from the Flamingo Hotel, was built and owned by Kirk Krikorian, described as the most elaborate hotel of all. In 1966, when Caesar's Palace opens, and incidentally, Caesar's Palace and Caesar's World are both the same. I called their offices in Century City uh, this week to check out what the difference was between them. Uh, Clifford Perlman, the head of Caesar's World, was kicked off the board in New Jersey, Atlantic City, because of its links to organized crime. The attorney for Caesar's World and Caesar's Palace, as I say, is William Casey of our Central Intelligence Agency. In 1966, when Kerkorian is working with Caesar's Palace, Robert Mayhew from the FBI and the CIA counterintelligence moves into Vegas to make the purchases for Howard Hughes of the various hotels that Hughes is going to swallow up in the Vegas area. Kerkorian buys a parcel for his operations, and the used people come in and uh, buy up the Frontier Hotel, the Castaways, the Sands, the Silver Dollar, the Landmark, the Harold's Club in Reno, the 518-acre Crook Ranch that belonged to the ammunition people in Germany, Paradise Valley Country Club, local TV stations. So between the Summa Corporation, which is the used organization, and Howard has never seen, and between Kirk Kerkorian, they really have the state pretty well locked up. Uh, Robert Mayu moves in, as I say, experience with his CIA and counterintelligence, and he was the cover for the assassination teams of John Kennedy. Uh, well, John Kennedy was killed in 1963, but Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X are to come later, and other people in the way of the government that they wanted removed. And it was Mayu that met with Sam Giacon and John Roselli and uh, organized crime figures to head up assassination teams, and he shared also his establishment with Mo Dallas, who, since the Kennedy assassination, was moved down to La Costa. So Mayu is working for the Summa Corporation. Justice Douglas, in 1966, marries Kathleen Heffernan, H-E-F-F-E-R-N-A-N, after a two-day engagement, and as the town is pretty busy. Now, Mayu worked in Chicago before he came here with Guy Bannister, who later goes down to Florida, had the Double Check Organization in New Orleans, worked with Lee Harvey Oswald in counterintelligence, and that again goes back to Pan Am and Air America and the CIA airlines that were covering these operations down in Florida with the Bay of Pigs and the anti-Castro Cubans. In 1968, the used people, the Summa Corporation, tried to keep Kerkorian from finishing a piece of property that he had out the, called the International Hotel, but they weren't very successful. Uh, Hughes had accumulated a lot of money. He had at one time 80% of TWA stock. Now, the Hughes organization buys up part of the town, and Kerkorian has another part of the town, and they are operating very successfully. The 
governor of the Nevada at the time is now Senator Paul Laxalt, who managed the campaign for Ronald Reagan for his election. And the attorney for uh, these people, as I say, is the attorney general of the United States. Uh, Howard Hughes and Mayo had an option to buy the Stardust Hotel. Uh, at the one time, it was owned by Jake the Barber from Chicago, another organized crime figure. And uh, then the Desert Inn Associates, before Howard Hughes moved to Vegas, were run by Mo Dallas. The Hughes people come in and buy up the Desert Inn for Mo Dallas. Uh, the Mayfield Road Gang from Cleveland, Ohio, organized crime. And Modellitz leaves and works as a consultant to Summa Corporation, Howard Hughes, and builds up La Costa down near San Diego. In 1962, Kerkorian, who had built Caesar, in 66, he built Caesar's Palace. But in 62, he sold his airline, Transcontinental Airline, to Studebaker Company and invested $25 million dollars in land to open the Caesar Palace. It took him four years. He sold his airline and parlayed it to Caesar's Palace. And the funding again comes from Trans America, the Bank of America, uh, the Bank of Italy originally. He also formed another company called Tracy Investment Company, and he set up a subsidiary in the Flamingo Resort, a hotel owned formerly by Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, Mr. Gus Baum, who was blown up in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, he bought the Flamingo Hotel, the outfit from the Parv and Dorman Group in 1967 for $12 million. So Kerkorian was active in Vegas before he uh, got into MGM Hotel uh, and the MGM Studios. He sold his airlines, as I say, to Studebaker, put up Caesar's Palace, and uh, had a lot of money floating in all kinds of operations. Another subsidiary the International Hotel of Las Vegas, starting in 1967. He put up Caesar's Palace in 66. Then he wanted to build the International Hotel, which to what became the MGM Grand Hotel. And he brought in to Las Vegas in 1967 Fred Benninger. Now, that's a long introduction to Fred Benninger. He's the one put by Neil Burke on the board of MGM. Fred Benninger, for 21 years, worked for Flying Tiger Airlines. Flying Tiger was one of the first subsidiaries of uh, the CIA. It was known for narcotics traffic through the Vietnam War for heroin and so forth out of Southeast Asia, run by Madame Chenault and Claire Chenault. There are many books and documents on the Flying Tigers. So the expert that Kerkorian brings into the Vegas area is 21 years with the Flying Tigers, which means that he had to be with it a long time, since 1946 when it first started. Uh, he was of Germanic origin, another German name uh, referred with a hard G, Benninger. He became one of Kerkorian's chief lieutenants. So the person assisting Kerkorian here in Vegas uh, to build a $60 million hotel was Benninger of the Flying Tigers. This is through the whole Vietnam War, the narcotics wars in 1967, the year that Benninger went into Vegas for the MGM Hotel working with Kerkorian, was the year that Michael Hand arrived in Australia. I keep referring to the Nugenhan Bank that became the pivotal place for narcotics traffic, for assassination teams, for uh, overthrowing governments, the combination of the CIA, heroin, and the killer teams. For, uh, in 1967, Michael Han, with no experience, who worked with the special forces in Vietnam, he opened his bank, he went into Australia in 1976, and he then eventually opened up with the CIA, with Air America, with the Flying Tiger, the Dope, the Counterintelligence, Navy Intelligence, Edwin Wilson, and Theodore Shackley. Michael Han was to work with these people. He opens up in 1967, leaves Vietnam, to set up headquarters in Australia. And Benninger of the Flying Tigers arrives in Las Vegas. Fred Benninger went to work for Kerkorian. He suggests, he's the one who suggested, let's buy up the Flamingo Hotel. That was the old mob group until we get our big hotel going. It was supposed to be the International, became the MGM Grand. Um, Kerkorian kept the Flamingo Hotel. He held on to it, and he called his new company then the International Leisure, and they had subsidiaries, and then he flew to New York and picked up $60 million. This is for his operations, Kerkorian. Now, Western Airlines had a route that Kerkorian wanted to improve from Hawaii, Alaska, Mexico, St. Paul. They have mail, and since 1969, Kerkorian had watched over Western Airlines. 
It was worth $73 million. And he went to Mr. Claus and the vice uh, chairman of Bank of America, who now heads the World Bank. Uh, he was interested in buying Metro Goldwyn Mayer uh, Studios, the MGM. And he went to Europe, as I mentioned last week, for money to buy that studio. Uh, questionable whether it came from Bernie Cornfield or Vesco or Onassis or Swiss banks from skimming from the Vegas money. And lo and behold, he comes up with his $50 million to put in to MGM. Now, the New York Post in 1979 had headlines, Link of Kerkorian with the Mafia. And it seemed that Frank Hogan, who was a district attorney for Tom Dewey, in the days when they were investigating the Vito Genovese family, picked up tape recordings of Mr. Kerkorian talking to members of organized crime, and specifically Vito Genovese. Now, Tom Dewey was running for president, uh, Earl Warren was to be his vice president. In 1961, when the recordings were made, Robert Kennedy was the attorney general going after organized crime. Vito Genovese worked with Jack Ruby and Carlos Marcello and David Ferry of the CIA and the assassination teams described in uh, the Torbett document and in other researches, uh, and even the Senate in, or House investigation of the assassination of John Kennedy, the links of organized crime. But the Warren Commission... In the volumes on Jack Ruby describes the meeting of Vito Genovese, the military with Jack Ruby. Uh, there's testimony of a witness to that. Well, Frank Hogan in 61, Frank Hogan, H-O-G-A-N, was tapping the, no, the Cosa Nostra family and picking up conversations of Vito Genovese with Charles the Blade Turin and with Kirk Kerkorian. And it goes back to George Raft and people involved in the transcontinental uh, airlines that he had, the military routes. Kerkorian in 61 was running his international airlines, uh, as I say, a million with commercial, four million with military. He had direct contacts with Vito Genovese in 1961 when Robert Kennedy was investigating and tapping organized crime in Kerkorian later is working in Vegas with Robert Mayhew at the Flamingo Hotel and with Mo Dallitz and with the assassination teams that would go on and take Robert Kennedy and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and the organized crime connections and the military connections. So in 1961, when he was flying transcontinental lines, he was in contact with the Genovese family, who was also in touch with Jack Ruby and the military, and uh, these telephone conversations were taped. Kerkorian was taped by Frank Hogan, the DA of New York City at the time. There were 12 telephone conversations with Charlie the Blade Tureen. Now, Tureen was part of the Genovese family. As I say, the Genovese worked directly with Jack Ruby, who killed Lee Harvey Oswald, so that the links of the Kennedy assassination, both to the organized crime or the CIA or to the Nazi connections, would be wiped out. In 67, Kerkorian was to buy the Flamingo Hotel from Bugsy Siegel. Meyer Lansky, he owns the Caesars Palace. Robert Kennedy, the attorney general, is tapping these people. The mob was mad at uh, John Kennedy. They were mad at Robert Kennedy. So you have persons here involved in trans-international airlines, working for the military, military bases, working with narcotics traffic. And in 1963, Kennedy was killed by mob and military in 1968, Robert Kennedy was killed by mob and military and people trying to fight the um, it, investigation of the exposure of the drug connections. Kerkorian it wasn't in Vegas in 1961, but he was wiretapped with connections to Charles Turin, who was directly linked to Meyer Lansky. Robert Kennedy was going into Jimmy Hoffa and Meyer Lansky at the time. Kikorian threw off these tape conversations. He was casual about them. Um, he, he, this scandal broke at a time where he's very big in Las Vegas in 1979 and big in MGM. Now, the book on Kikorian asks, where did he get $72 million in foreign bank loans? This is on page 234. Where does he get his money? And it goes into those rumors of various possibilities and banks. Who is Charles Turin, who Kerkorian was talking to in 1961 on the wiretaps? Uh, Turin is described in books on Meyer Lansky's life as being part of the Lansky operation with underworld connections in Havana, in uh, Cuba, before Fidel Castro came in. That's why the anti-Castro Cubans with the CIA 
people like Frank Sturgis, who ran the gaming tables over in Cuba, are so willing to work with the uh, the anti-Castro Cubans work with the intelligence community and their gambling operations were thrown out there. Kukorian was working or talking with Tureen and Meyer Lansky in 61 and this group of people stayed close together. Edwin Wilson, who headed Task Force 157 with their operations in Australia under the guise of the Navy, was paymaster for the Bay of Pigs. E. Howard Hunt was a paymaster for the Bay of Pigs. Theodore Shackley, who came from Germany, who works with Wilson and Turple, and these people worked, all of them with Air America, the Flying Tigers, the mob, drug connections, and Benninger, as I say, worked for the Flying Tigers for uh, 21 years before he came to Vegas. Charles Turin is described in Hank Messick's book on Meyer Lansky of the involvement of the operations of casinos in Havana in the 50s. The new Capri uh, Casino run by the Mafia, headed by the Blade, Charles Turin and Meyer Lansky's connections, and George Raft and Bugsy Siegel and the syndicate. Now, when the scandal came out about uh, Kokorians being wiretapped on telephone conversations with these people, Paul Laxalt came to bat in 1971 for Kokorian. Paul Laxalt, as I say, was the man who managed the um, campaign and raising the funds for Ronald Reagan to be president of the United States. He was the governor of Nevada when Kerkorian and the Super uh, Summa Corporation flowed into there and poured hundreds of millions of dollars into the operations in Las Vegas and Nevada. By 1971, Kerkorian was heading MGM Studios with Fred Benninger by his side, planning to build that new hotel in Vegas. Fred Benninger went on to be the head of the MGM Hotel in Las Vegas. And as I say, two, three days before Air Florida went down and Air Florida was trying to make a purchase of Western Airlines, he was put on the board of Western Airlines. MGM wanted to diversify and uh, they have their finger in Western, the Western Airlines, the hotels and various operations and stocks in Vegas. Now, the story of um, free enterprise and, and people gaining capital and buying uh, particular businesses is a total fraud or front. The more I study it, the more hidden money, hidden bank accounts comes in that people come with huge amount of money and pluck up these operations and compete with each other. Now, if a small airline like Air Florida has never had a crash in 10 years and it has put in a bid in June and showed an interest in uh, accumulating the losing uh, Western Airlines, if it's competing against a force as big as this with tentacles in every pie from the Justice Department to the Attorney General to the Director of the CIA to all the highest elements of Washington, D.C., what chance do these little airlines have? Uh, Melvin Belli stepped in right away. for He's always worked with the CIA with this whole group to make as mean lawsuits as he can against Air Florida to break their back. What chance do these little companies have? Uh, this is a shocking story to me of the interconnections of the various studios, and then there's overlapping of people from the MGM to the 20th century, Fox Studios and Columbia Pictures of the same characters. One of the owners of this uh, Bonanza Hotel there were 16 acres that Kerkorian wanted in large in 1971, and he wanted to get a place called the Bonanza Hotel, owned by Realty Holding Company. And one of the owners associated with that is Mo Dallas, who had property, as I say, in Vegas, who's been named in the Torbett document of links to the various people responsible for killing John Kennedy and closely linked with Robert Mayhew and the other corporations. So one of the owners now with Kerkorian uh, is Mo Dallas under a, another hotel, the Bonanza Hotel. The price on this one was $13.2 million in 1967 when Mayu first came in for a piece of property in uh, in Vegas that's gone up much more now. It involves Robert Mayu and Mo Dallas and so forth. As I say, Mayu of the CIA and FBI has been a working with Mo Dallas continuously as a consultant. They work together in the Vegas area. And uh, the Interlocking, as I say, the interlocking groups of the huge organized crime syndicate to the banks in Australia, to Vietnam, to Southeast Asia. One of the reasons that these people keep promoting war and weapons and wars overseas, whether it's Korea 
or uh, Vietnam or Cuba or get into Central America has as much to do with drug traffic and drug profits as it does in selling weapons. This is a subject that has never, hardly ever, ever brought up, is that the thing that goads these people on is the mafia that controls them and wants this territory or their turf, just as they want to get back to Cuba and avenge Castro for taking over the hotels there. Well, I better stop now so we don't have trouble with that tape cassette. We're timing it, and I think we had a little trouble with the 30 minutes on that cassette. So I'm going to stop now to make sure we get it all on the tape, and I'll be back with you next week. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. This has been World Watchers International with noted conspiracy investigator Mae Brussel. This program originates from Carmel, California. I said it's better than pleasure. Funky butt, funky butt. All right, all right, all right. Now, do you want to get it on? Good Lord, what's that? It's KLRB, Carmel Monterey. I'm going to think about it. <laughs>